Hi, I'm Alexi. If you know me, you'll know that I'm a big fan of historic fashion and costume, but that I am also a classically trained animator and passionate about folklore. So I noticed a few years ago there was this trend that sometimes continues today where non-animators will quote-unquote fix the Disney princesses to be more historically accurate. I do find a lot of this content interesting and well done in that they make beautiful designs or they teach me about history, but often the end results are not viable for 2D animation especially. All the people that I've seen in this area have not been animators themselves. So I thought as an animator, I could bring a fresh take. Carolina Zabruska does a great video where she talks about this trend and the problems with it from the perspective of like historical accuracy is a very difficult thing, especially when you're talking about stories that are based on folklore, which might not necessarily have a specific date or location. She stays in her lane really well. I felt really respected as an animator by her video, so I definitely recommend recommend that, there'll be a link in the description. I wanted to make a few videos for my Patreon, specifically responding to the glamour videos on the subject of the Disney princesses. We're going to start with Snow White. I really like Raisa Patana. Uh, I hope I said her name right. I've gone out of my way to watch a lot of her videos and I could listen to her talk about fashion history for hours. I think Raisa Patana is really charming. I love her 30s look for the Snow White video. She specifically goes into the 30s aspect of the Snow White and why she respects the designs and says that they were right for the film. But then you'll still get other commenters, the audiences of these videos and these quote-unquote corrections kind of responding and wondering like, oh was Disney stupid? And feeling like the designs were quote-unquote wrong and being like, oh, this historically accurate design is better because of the accuracy. And I really want to push back against that type of thinking. So even though I'm responding to this video, I don't want to be negative towards her in any way. So I want to push back against the idea that inaccurate costumes are inherently wrong or badly done, especially for fantasy films. Sometimes this does end up being the case. There are a lot of issues with some of the princesses of color, such as Jasmine's design, and especially Pocahontas, who is sexualized, aged up, and given a very dramatic, sexy look. I think a lot of internet film criticism bases itself around logic and logical criticism, and even though I love historical accuracy criticism, this can also fall into that trap. As an animator, a fan of animation history and folklore, while I'm drawing, I wanted to offer some theoretical insight on why Disney made certain decisions about Snow White. First of all, let's talk about folklore and how they dated the film. The Grimm brothers were story collectors and wrote down stories that already existed via oral tradition. So even though Snow White is perceived as a German story, because of them, there are versions of Snow White from before the Grimm brothers throughout Europe and similar stories from around the world. Glamour dates the film as being meant to take place in 16th century Germany. I'll be loosely referencing this as the Renaissance era. Like, that is a whole hundred years, and having an animation take place in, like, a timeless quasi-medieval, quasi-Renaissance Europe is, like, fine. I know it frustrates a lot of historic fashion fans, but I don't think we should be opposed to timeless locations. In Mina Lee's Over the Garden Wall video, she expresses some frustrations toward inconsistencies, such as Beatrice's blue dress, which if it were to take place in the Regency era, would mark her as upper class instead of poor. If it's meant as a critique, I think it's disingenuous, because exaggeration is a principle of animation. And the blue dress's function is to symbolize her bluebird curse, and that's really important for her character. If you're going to craft an imaginary world by hand, why not make it a world that couldn't exist in real life? I think things like Over the Garden Wall and Cinderella taking place in these timeless locations where Over the Garden Wall is like all of the Victorian era and also the Regency and they've got some Rococo scenes and then Cinderella being like all of the Victorian era but also the 50s end up with really beautiful and memorable art direction. The problem with creating timeless like fantasy countries really only a problem for me when it's like complete lack of interest in history or complete lack of interest or poor research on 
the culture they're depicting like in Aladdin. Like, I'm not going to defend Aladdin. There are a lot of problems with Agrabah because of the racism, stereotyping, and the lack of Middle Eastern voices on the project. So there are a lot of illustrators, notably Claire Hummel, who have done like stunning illustrations of more quote-unquote accurate Disney princesses. An illustrator is not an animator, and most of these illustrators add detail and structure according to what will make their illustration beautiful. That's their goal, and that's great, but it's not accounting for how the garment would move and function in the film the way a concept artist or an animator would. So that being said, let's go and break down the parts of the costume like they do in the Glamour video. Hair. I'm going to kind of riff off the French hood and add a hairnet instead of the long hood. In Renaissance costumes, I think hairnets are really cute and I love the hairnet in Claire Hummel's interpretation of Snow White, but we already have enough details on the costume to keep track of, so I'm going to try to treat it as like a silk bonnet instead of strictly speaking a net material. I also think that like white people need to remember that women covered their hair or wore hats in some way for like the majority of human history, like including white women. So I don't know if it would end anti-hijabi sentiments, but like I think it would help us if we got more used to remembering that like most women covered their hair. So I'm going to include that. So I am going to ahistorically take out two long curls. We see some Regency influence in early Snow White designs, but also I think it makes little girls feel very cool and rebellious when they untuck a strand of hair. Like my sisters and I did it all the time after we watched Mulan. So fun fact, while researching I learned that the hairnet I referenced earlier is called a snood. It doesn't seem to be extremely popular in royal portraiture, but I feel like I see it a lot in recreation gowns and in Tudor period dramas. And I get that, I feel like the snood has like this timeless elegance and I think hairnets uh, have some opportunity for bejeweling that the French hood doesn't. Okay, so let's take a break while I draw some more details. So there are a lot of portraits of these Medici ladies and Tudor princesses I looked at where there's sort of two thick brocade strips at the front of the dress. So it's, I'm kind of inspired by that, but trying to keep it a little bit simpler. In the spirit of being open to timelessness and also being more historically thoughtful, I do want to disclose that I'm not being super strict about the Germanness of Snow White's look. Glamour also shows that they're being a little bit loose in that. There's not a whole lot of primary sources, especially compared to other eras. They include portraits and fashion trends from Spain, France, and Italy, which Risa Patana says influenced Germany. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the portraits I'm referencing are from the Medici family, which was originally Italian, but also like married into Germany and France and was hugely influential in the later half of the 1500s. The Medicis were basically the patrons for a lot of famous Renaissance artists. I'm also looking at a lot of Tudor portraits and some of the prints I've got saved are from the Netherlands. I also think some of my prints are probably from the 16th and 17th century, looking back at Renaissance fashion just because of the drawing styles in them and the fact that the printing press was still not entirely widespread, especially for the use of like fashion illustration. I still do think that these illustrations look pretty par for the course compared to the painted portraiture, so I don't feel ashamed of using them.
So face and makeup, this isn't something Glamour really covers, but something that I personally wanted to change. As a kid, I had a hard time reading Snow White as 14, the age she's supposed to be in the film, partially due to her heavy eyeshadow. For my take on Snow White, I'm trying to do a middle ground between the film's original look and how I would draw a more natural looking 14 year old girl. I'm keeping her iconic red lips because that's part of the folktale, uh, lips as red as blood. And I'm keeping the blush because I think it was a really cool part of the original film that the colorists and like the color department was mostly women and was the main part where women worked art jobs at Disney at the time. They painted her makeup in this like very specific, sophisticated way that like showed they had experience with makeup. And I do really admire that about the Snow White makeup. It just makes her to me read like she's 18, 20, which makes sense because she is based on these older Hollywood starlets at the time. Um, and maybe they just shouldn't have said that her character is 14. I'm gonna keep her eyes simple with minimal lashes and no eyeshadow. So the bodice and the collar. I'm adding just a little bit more trim to the bodice. We're keeping that line from the original design and making it thicker to allude to the idea of front lacing without anybody having to draw the dress being tied up. So this thick gold trim can also imply an embroidered brocade like we see in the Medici portraits. And I would like to maybe have the fabric shine or react in scenes with extreme lighting like the forest chase scene, but overall when she's in the cottage or in the castle, the gold will stay one color to keep things simpler for the colorists. I'm also happy to take Glamour's suggestion and give Snow White a partlet. I think it's really cute. In the Snow White costume I had as a kid, the collar was super floppy and that always annoyed me. I think the partlet can maintain the structure and still contribute to a unique silhouette. sleeves. So Glamour drawing their Snow White with little slashes really just made me feel this certain existential exhaustion. Like a hundred tiny slashes in a sleeve aren't going to look that great in animation considering the amount of work it would take to keep track of them fluidly and not make them look like weird static. Like people do effects in animation like very famously the swirling sparkles from the Cinderella transformation. Like, those are like brief, those are one-time things. Like, I, the slashes detail is just really what broke me. Um, so, we're gonna return to the original sleeves and just make them longer to fit more Renaissance styles and give them a cute cuff. So shoes, the Glamour video doesn't really address this because there aren't excellent examples of shoes from this time period, but my skirt is shorter than the average princess skirt, the way I've drawn it. So I wanted to give Snow White some nice, sensible shoes to run in. I think embracing the buckled shoe can make kids feel very historical when they're wearing them with a Snow White costume, even though the buckled shoe is more Georgian and Rococo. Um, I don't know if Disney would go for this idea now because the princess shoes are a huge part of the costumes they sell. I just love a good fantasy buckled shoe. So in her peasant dress, she does wear clogs instead of the pumps that she wears later. And I think like, because we don't have a lot of examples of shoes outside of men's shoes in this era, they were looking at peasant Dutch paintings and saw some Dutch clogs. And you know, I think they make a cute silhouette. I don't necessarily know if this is historically accurate or not. I didn't decide to go for clogs. Cause as I said, I'm a really big fan of the buckle shoe. So there is something kind of funny about while I was drawing this, my calm driver had died and 
that's pretty common, you know, if you have a Wacom. Um, I didn't want to restart because I was in the zone, so I like made my process needlessly difficult. So I usually do more traditional art, uh, so my digital art process can be kind of bananas. I block in these broad shapes and like spend like 30 minutes cleaning them up, which is more difficult without my tablet being its best self. I also decided to keep things relatively simple shading wise to keep the feel what it would look like on an animation cell rather than my normal shading which tends to have a lot of layers. So while I was working on this, I watched Mina Lee's Anastasia video. Some animators must have left her some frustrated comments because I thought her critique was much more well-rounded and understanding of like when you're critiquing 2D animation for historical accuracy, you do mostly want to be talking about the silhouette and broad details. I didn't see the comments she got. I pray that they were like graceful and understanding, but regardless she took the criticism on board really well and I think understanding the medium you're critiquing helps you to be a stronger critic. So even though I said something about her earlier, I definitely don't want to be dissing her in any way. I really enjoy her videos and she clearly puts a lot of research into them. I especially recommend part two of her Disney princess video series where she talks about the Renaissance princesses and covers Pocahontas and Jasmine really well. Some other things I wanted to mention, this video is sped up at different speeds at different points. Some of the clips are sped up to 200 or more. Uh, I do not actually draw this fast, just full disclosure on that one. I think the original drawing took me about an hour and if things are shortened in this one to just under 30 minutes. But in the end, I'm really glad that Raisa Batana has such a love of 1930s fashion and I think it's genuinely charming when you start to look at historic fashion. You can tell when one era is looking back at another. Like the 30s-ness of Snow White is genuinely part of the charm for me. It's not my favorite princess film or even my favorite adaptation of Snow White, but it is really incredible as a part of animation history as a part of fashion history. If you look at any Japanese takes on like Western, like typical princess costumes or especially prince costumes, you'll end up seeing them going straight to Snow White, which I think is really cute. So there's some concept art of Snow White where she's wearing this lovely Regency dress, possibly connected to the first Grimm collection being published in 1812, possibly because the slender skirt was in vogue in the 1930s. I don't know exactly when this was drawn in the production process, but I, I do already see some strong indications of where they would go with her hair and her sleeves, which are retained in the final form. There are other versions where Snow White has a fuller skirt again. I'm happy to give her a fuller skirt. I'm also happy to give her stockings. It's a very easy adjustment. What I'm not going to do is commit to the idea of a Spanish farthingale supporting it. Animation is the art of movement. Snow White was aiming for realism, not in history, but in movement. 
So Snow White has two very iconic scenes, first her running through the forest, and then her dance with the dwarves. For both of these, I want her to be able to move and dance, and I want the skirt to move fluidly still. So what I ended up with was a thicker outer skirt made of a stiffer material and retaining the more fluid yellow skirt underneath. We're gonna pretend this is all supported by a few layers of petticoats or like maybe a weird shaped pannier around the hips if you wanna get the hip volume and you were like the princess in the park wearing this dress. I also want the skirt to still not be floor length partially for the action sequences and partially because it's just easier and more fun to play in for little kids who would be wearing the costume. And these are all, I think, if you're a Disney concept artist, things that are being discussed in meetings that aren't being discussed if you are just redesigning for this idea of historical accuracy. So the trend in animation until this point was mostly a style known as a rubber hose. It was very stylized. Even when they used rotoscope, it wasn't necessarily for the point of realism. We can even see some early pieces of concept art by Grim Natwick, who designed Buddy Boop in Snow White's production history. With Snow White, Disney wanted to change gears and be taken seriously and show that he could make the equivalent of realism of a live action film. So he was really interested in dramatic movement and flow in the garments like you would see with Ginger Rogers dancing. If Snow White wore a stiff farthingale or another cage-like supportive garment, we wouldn't be able to see as much movement from her legs. And even if this was historically realistic, it would probably feel a little bit stylized to see her move with it, especially at the time. There's this thing where like you can pull off certain things as photographs but you can't pull them off as illustrations. Like you'll take a reference photo and the foreshortening, you'll believe it because it's a photograph and because it really exists. But then when you see it and draw the exact same thing in animation, it doesn't feel right. So here we go. This is my take on Snow White as a version that is slightly more historically accurate, but also still functional for a 2D animated film. I don't think this design would be like hell to animate. What really got the glamour video for me is in the second half they do the Evil Queen, which I would also love to do. Um, I have a sketch of her over there in the corner that you might have noticed. And they walk away with identical silhouettes and color schemes for both characters. And it just made me, ugh. You know, I was like, wow. They are doing this for an educational purpose. I acknowledge that. But um, when you walk away with identical silhouettes, identical color schemes, it's like, wow. Like, you removed all distinguishing factors between these characters, especially from a studio that really values unique silhouettes. Um, it's bad character design, and I know character design wasn't their priority. And I do see the irony with like me critiquing someone for something they weren't prioritizing, but that's also what a lot of these videos, particularly if they talk about kind of the original three, Snow White, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty, are also critiquing someone 
like really in depth for something that like was not the priority for the artists themselves. Yeah, um, next I would love to do the Evil Queen if you thought this was interesting that and draw that middle ground for her. Um, Glamour also does two looks for Belle, which like Belle's a little bit more modern and I think it's like a little bit different of a take because the rest of it is clearly like Rococo and then she has that like ugly Victorian dress. So we can just like redesign that for fun and talk about the glamour video kind of. So if you are watching this during the YouTube wide release, um, please support my Patreon. My videos are not monetized, so Patreon is one of the only places you can support me. I have a $1 tip jar and then for a simple $5, you can get my videos a uh, whole month before they land on YouTube. I also have some art tutorials where I talk about animation and designing for animation, particularly stop motion, which is my expertise. Thank you for joining me for this speed paint slash historical rant slash discussion of character design. I think when you're producing for Disney, especially for a Disney princess, if you're producing from like the 80s forward and you're designing a Disney princess, you need to be thinking about not just how she functions in the film, but how the costume would function on dolls, on children's costumes, in the parks. How does it look compared to the other existing princesses in the lineups? So I think it's a really interesting question of character design to also have to think about them in this larger than life as part of this uh, merchandise line, as well as just a piece of art within their existing story. So thank you. Um, tell me if you want the Evil Queen or Belle next, especially if you are on my Patreon. I will be more likely to listen to you. Please uh, like and subscribe. I also have a Twitter and an Instagram. Both of them are at Alexi Does Art. If you want to follow my work and see more updates on when new videos are going to drop and what they'll be. I also recently got a TikTok, which is underscore Alexi Does Art. Someone had already taken my username, which kind of bummed me out. Yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Bye!